So um, I'd like to start today um, by welcoming all of you here. Um, this is, I think, going to be a very, very informative hour. And I'm looking forward to hearing from um, all of our presenters today. We've got a wide range of federal agencies represented and um, we're gonna move through things pretty quickly, uh, but we will be able to get um, some presentations back to you and, um, and local and regional contact information for these agencies. Um, and then we'll be posting the recording of this webinar on our YouTube. And so um, watch for an email um, from me with all of that information. And so before I hand it off to Jim McPherson, I want to start with a land acknowledgement and um, I'm putting a link in the chat. Um, um, if you don't know um, the lands on which you are um, sitting today, you can click on that link and it'll take you to a map. I am zooming in from Indakina, the lands and the waterways of the Abenaki, Wabanaki and Penacook peoples, past, present and future. And you can feel free um, to type into the chat um, where you are calling in from today. So without further ado, I'm handing this over to Jim McPherson, who is the FEMA Region 1 Long-Term Recovery Task Force um, Coordinator. And so Jim, thank you so much for uh, moderating today. And here we go. Thank you. Hey, th thank you, Jenny. So I'm, I'm Jim McPherson. I'm a federal coordinating officer um, for FEMA. And that means I'm not a FEMA coordinating officer. I'm not coordinating just FEMA programs. My job is to coordinate federal programs. So the last uh, two days, I've been 40 feet underground at the MEMA bunker in uh, Framingham, Mass. I just want to know, it, did the storm pass? Are we, is it okay to come up now? <laughs> We're really isolated down there. Um, but my job with FEMA is response and recovery. Yesterday was the response part. Today is the recovery piece. So FEMA does both jobs. So what my goal is, is what can we do to listen to the states? The states are our customer. What can we do for long-term recovery to identify outcomes? So it's not just information sharing, it's real outcomes for what you, the, the state wanted. So um, it's, it's, my, it's my pleasure really to be with all of you uh, today, New Hampshire Arts, and, and to talk about federal funding and the programs. And I wanna really thank uh, Jenny for her leadership with the art solution based team that we're doing and the partnership with our task force. And we've been doing this for about a year in all six states. And what we do is we listen to what the states want. So New Hampshire, the response and recovery stakeholders said the impact on COVID on the arts community is something that needs to be uh, identified and find solutions for. So that's what we're doing today. So my job is I'm able to reach back because I'm a federal coordinator back to Washington, DC to the 108 federal agencies so what we call the Repo uh, recovery support function leadership group. So today we're really lucky. We're gonna have several federal agencies to talk about their programs. And what we're doing is trying to match, create a federal menu of the solutions for the ask from the New Hampshire Arts Council. So to get right into that today, uh, let's start off with Andy Mathis. Uh, he's the state and regional specialist for the National Endowment for the Arts. Hi everybody. I'm happy to be here with you today. My role at the NEA is working with the state arts agencies and regional arts organizations across the country. So I work closely with Ginny and Cassie at the New Hampshire State Council on the Arts and the folks at the New England Foundation for the Arts. I'll be telling you about our grant programs and our arts and healthcare and creative placemaking initiatives. I know there's an upcoming webinar just on creative placemaking, so I want to ensure that you've got that information. I want you to leave this meeting with a general overview of the NEA and feel comfortable reading our guidelines or contacting staff about projects that you're considering. We're a small agency, 150 people. Even so, we're the largest arts funder in America, public or private, that supports the arts in all 50 states and six U.S. territories. In addition, 
We're a project partner with every state arts agency, regional arts organization, and with other federal agencies and their departments. We are primarily a grant making agency. We also have several national initiatives that provide opportunities to experience quality arts programming, and we support arts research and analysis too. These are our grant funding categories, and I'll be focusing on the ones in red as they are likely the most relevant to the majority of you. I'll say a quick word about the others first though. Our support to the states and regions is funding that they further distribute to you all through their own grant programs. And our research grants are for data mining and analysis of huge data sets related to the arts. And we do have two grant categories for individuals, creative writing fellowships. In alternate years, these are either for prose or poetry and translation projects. Full details are on our website at arts.gov. Challenge America primarily supports smaller organizations for projects that reach and serve underserved communities. Applicants must address how their organization or audience has been underserved. And this is defined by our legislation and agency policy and refers to those whose opportunities to experience the arts are limited by geography, ethnicity, economics, or disability. Grants for arts projects, or GAP, is our largest category, and the grant amounts are larger than those in Challenge America. Support is available for all stages of the artistic process, including creation, presentation and exhibition, arts education and enrichment, as well as services to the field, such as conferences or professional development. Our town is our creative placemaking grant category. It focuses on strengthening local communities through arts and culture, and it involves deliberate integration of arts, culture, and design into these efforts. Successful Our Town projects ultimately lay the groundwork for systemic changes that last. And that's why we require a partnership between a nonprofit and local government. Exploring Our Town is a fantastic database on our website of about 80 previous Our Town projects that you can study to learn more about creative placemaking and what made those projects work. You'll be able to sort the stories based on size of community or by project types, such as asset mapping, community design, cultural districts, or public art. For all the projects I've talked about so far, these are the eligibility requirements for applicants. You've got to be a 501c3 or a unit of state or local government or a federally recognized tribe or tribal community, a school district or a nonprofit college or university. In my allotted time, I'm only going to focus on our creative placemaking and arts and healthcare national initiatives, but we do have plenty more. For example, I have three of our education initiatives up on the screen now, and perhaps some of you or your family members have participated in some of these. Our Mayor's Institute on City Design convenes mayors and design experts to solve the most critical planning and design challenges facing their cities. They address issues such as downtown and neighborhood revitalization, transportation planning, creative placemaking, Main Street and commercial corridor redevelopment, and affordable housing, among others. And our partner on the Citizens Institute on Rural Design is the Housing Assistance Council. The program funds small towns and rural and tribal communities to host a local design workshop. The workshops bring together local residents and leaders from all sectors to work with design, planning, and creative placemaking professionals to address the community's pressing design needs. Moving on to arts and health, our Creative Forces Initiative is a partnership with the U.S. Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs and the state and local arts agencies. It seeks to improve the health, wellness, and quality of life for military and veteran populations exposed to trauma and for their families and caregivers. Creative arts therapies and visual arts, music, and writing are placed at the core of patient-centered care at military clinical sites throughout the country. The mask you're looking at, as part of the visual arts therapies, blank masks are provided and the service people are able to express their feelings about their experiences through their artwork. Sometimes they're able to bring up things this way that they would have a harder time initiating conversation about in more traditional talk therapy. The Sound Health Network is a partnership with the University of California, San Francisco, NIH, the Kennedy Center for the 
Performing Arts, and opera star Renee Fleming, the center's artistic advisor. The network was established to promote research and public awareness about the impact of music on health and wellness. And since 2011, the NEA has convened a federal interagency task force on the arts and human development to encourage more and better research on how the arts can help people reach their full potential at all stages of life. Task force members represent multiple agencies across federal government. Our program guidelines are on the website. If you have questions once you read them, feel free to reach out to our program specialists. We love hearing from prospective applicants and are eager to help you be successful. And you can sign up for a variety of newsletters at the bottom of our homepage. And with that, I'll say thank you very much and look forward to responding to questions at the end. Thank you, Andy. Um, and then we'll and then we will hold the questions in until the end, um, but you can also put them in the chat too. Uh, next up is uh, David Cohen, uh, Economic Development Specialist with uh, EDA. David. Great, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here today to talk about the American Rescue Plan Act funding um, to the council. And that's the focus of my presentation today. Briefly, Economic Development Administration is part of the Department of Commerce. We focus on increasing America's global economic competitiveness. We support community-led economic development, and we help communities develop resilient and agile local economies. We're broken down into regions. The Philadelphia office covers New Hampshire, and I'll be talking from that perspective today. Um, this website is key, eda.gov slash ARPA. It talks about the rescue plan programs. There are seven different initiatives and I'll be talking about two of them today. Travel Tourism Outdoor Recreation, which is $750 million, and Economic Adjustment Assistance, which is our broadest program, the most flexible program for $500 million. The total funding under ARPA, the rescue plan, is $3 billion. Under Travel Tourism Outdoor Recreation, the states are getting grants and also territories totaling $510 million. New Hampshire is getting $8.3 million of that. And with that $8.3 million, New Hampshire is in the process of applying for that money, and they'll get to determine with some degree of latitude about how to spend that money. So I have no idea um, what their proposal is going to say because it's not been submitted yet. For competitive, there's $240 million available. For travel tourism outdoor recreation, the general range per award is between half a million and $10 million. Generally, there's 80% EDA funding with 20% match. Um, and moving on to economic adjustment assistance, that's $500 million. I'll talk more about that in detail, but the general range of awards in that is $500,000 to $5 million. And again, generally there's an 80% EDA funding with a 20% match. Talking about the um, economic adjustment assistance program with a little bit more detail, um, we have a wide range of what we can offer that money for. Um, the money can be for both construction and construction projects, including public works and infrastructure, technical planning, workforce development. We encourage collaboration, also long-term visioning and projects. Projects have to be supported by a local government or a state agency. And again, I mentioned before what the awards are up to. I won't go into detail, but out of that $500 million, $200 million are for coal communities. Briefly, coal communities might actually include parts of New Hampshire, in that if there have been coal powered um, power plants before that have been decommissioned, then you could be eligible for that $200 million carve out of the $500 million as a coal community. With the investment priorities, all applications have to address at least one or more investment priorities. Um, by its very nature in that this is recovery money, ARPA, it will address the second one, recover resilience. Equity is our new focus, it's our main focus, our top focus. And you can go to the website listed to look at more detail about the investment priorities. Before applying, I encourage you to go to the website to read the notices of funding and the FAQs. And that's key. That gives you instructions, guidelines, goes into levels of detail. And the FAQs answer a wide range of questions for the different funding opportunities. For the applicant types, oftentimes there's confusion. We cannot give funding awards to individuals or for-profits, including pass-throughs of for-profits. We generally fund nonprofits, units of government at the state, local, and county level, and um, organizations of higher education, and also um, tribal communities as well. We encourage you to contact EDA, have a conversation before you develop your application, so we can guide you and talk you through, and also initially say, 
is this something which might be viable or maybe you're better off identifying other funding sources as well. Grant applications are made via grants.gov. Before you apply, you have to have a number of different systems in place, including DUNS, login.gov, SAM.gov, and grants.gov. And that takes time. So I encourage you to um, start to go to those websites and start to apply for those systems in order to be able to apply via grants.gov. For economic adjustment assistance, I covered some of these before, but number three, the matches have to be committed, available, non-encumbered, and non-include federal funds. And also the grants have to be aligned with the SEDS, a comprehensive economic development strategy. If you can't find your SEDS, contact us. We have resources to identify the SEDS as well. Um, also, we're not allowed to support certain projects. We cannot do housing. We cannot do casinos gaming and also other ones listed as well. And also they have to be, again, as I mentioned before, tied into our investment priorities. The next steps to apply are again, read the funding notice um, and reach out to the Philadelphia office. The contact for the state is Alan Brigham. His contact information is in the slide deck and it's on the screen right now. And also again, go to eda.gov slash ARPA for a wealth of information about the funding opportunities, recorded webinars, slides, FAQs, support tools as well. And if you have any questions, please reach out to Alan or also reach out to me. We're happy to guide you. And thank you again for the opportunity and glad to be here today and look forward to answering questions later. Thank you. Hey, thank you, David. Uh, next up is uh, Rachel Roderick, uh, Deputy uh, District Director for the Small Business Administration. Hi everyone, good morning. Thanks for having us here today. So as, um, as was said, my name is Rachel Roderick. I'm the Deputy District Director for the SBA in New Hampshire. Um, just wanna to get to my slides here real quick. All right. So the SBA helps businesses in a variety of different ways. Most people are well aware that we guarantee business loans. So that's our usual course of business um, when we're not in the disaster mode is that we work with our participating lenders to get capital to small businesses, either to start, grow or expand their businesses. We also have a network of um, resource partners that help us provide free business advising and training to small businesses in all different topics. Uh, we help companies expand into new markets through federal contracting assistance and export assistance. And what we've been spending the majority of our time over the last 18 months is on disaster recovery. So under our normal program, why lenders would look to the SBA guarantee is if there's uh, for a variety of different reasons. And it's mostly just to try to reduce some of the risks that the lenders have um, in order to do loans on their own. So there, there could be a collateral shortfall, it could just be a new business or a change of ownership. So the risk is higher. Um, certain industries have more risks than others. Or even if a business just needs a longer term to pay a loan back than, than the lender is comfortable on their own, those are all reasons why they would look to the SBA um, guarantee as a credit enhancement to get that loan to the business. Normally, I would say we do not have grants available to individual businesses, but um, there is exceptions now under the, the COVID um, rules. So under our normal programs, we do not, but we do have some um, assistance, which I'll talk about in one second here. Um, to, just to give you a snapshot of how many loans we do in New Hampshire. So this is as our fiscal year, which started in October. And these are the numbers as of July 31st. So even in spite of all the disaster assistance we've been given uh, through the SBA, we still are doing some regular loans uh, through our normal programs. So we're almost at 550 loans for $223 million. Uh, the majority of these come through our 7A program. That's our most flexible loan program that can be used for you know, working capital, buying equipment, all the way up to you know, purchasing real estate. We've done almost 300 loans there for 98 million. Um, our 504 program, which is very active because of the low interest rates, this finances um, basically real estate transactions and it's a partnership with our participating lenders. So our piece of those loans was 54 million, but the total projects financed under that program is 124 million when you, um, you know, add in the, the third party financing from our lenders that is also part of those projects. 
And then we're really excited that our microloan program has got some traction. Um, we've been trying to expand that for the last few years. So we have a pretty uh, active microloan intermediary now in New Hampshire. We were able to do 14 loans for $566 million so far. So on to the disaster assistance. Most people were aware of the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, we were able to help for-profits and non-profits under this program, which is not our usual um, customer in SBA. We know, mostly deal with for-profit entities, but these, these programs were open to non-profits as well. Um, we're mostly looking at forgiveness now through the, through the PPP program because the loan has ended. It ended in May, but SBA is very focused on helping businesses and our lenders through the forgiveness process, either directly through the, the lender or we also opened up a direct forgiveness process for those smaller loans up to 150000 where businesses can, can apply very easily in less than 10 minutes and the lender can just review it really quickly and get those loans forgiven, So, which is really important because we want to get those those, um, you know, give some relief to those small businesses so that they're assured that those loans are going to be forgiven and also get capital back um, to our lenders as well. So this program, we did 41,000, over 41,000 loans in New Hampshire for $3.7 billion under that program, which to put that in perspective is about 25 years of our normal lending program that we normally do. So very um, grateful to our lenders who really stepped up and got those loans out to businesses to help keep those people on the payroll um, during COVID. One program that's still available uh, is the COVID IDLE program, and that's the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. This is a direct loan available through the SBA. Uh, we've done over 11,000 of these in New Hampshire so far. It is still open to new applications and it is open to both for-profits and non-profit entities to apply. And really, this is considered to be the long-term solution. It's a 30-year term. It's for working capital to get businesses, you know, that long-term solution at a very low interest rate. It's 3.75 fixed for businesses, 2.75 fixed for nonprofits. Um, there's no penalties to pay it off early, so you can get it. Um, have a pretty generous um, deferment period on that. So no payments due right away. So it's definitely something to look into. If you have not looked into it, um, we encourage you to reach out to us to do that. Um, it does also include some grant uh, money targeted advances for those businesses or, or organizations that are located in low income areas and can demonstrate that they had at least a 30% reduction in revenues. Um, so that program is the one that is still open and available. So I want to make sure people um, who haven't taken advantage of that definitely look into it. Also, for those that already received loans, you probably would be eligible for an increase because they've changed the way that those loans are calculated. So again, reach out to our office if we can help you navigate that process. One of the other exciting programs that SBA rolled out is the uh, Shuttered Venue Grant Program. This recently closed on the 20th of um, August, but we were able to do 55 of these awards uh, in New Hampshire for $28 million. And this really allowed us to work with the arts industry pretty closely. We did a lot of small independent theaters, um, you know, some movie theaters and any, they, and, you know, really live venue operators. Um, so it was a new uh, customer for SBA to deal with. We were able to visit some of them um, and help them out both with the PPP program and the, the Shuttered Venue Grant program. And really, you know, we're all about partnerships in SBA. And these are, uh, this is a snapshot of our resource partners, which we have longstanding relationships with all of these entities. And they really helped us um, help small businesses navigate not only our programs, but all of the programs that are available uh, through the state and other entities to help businesses through all of this. But they're also around for the long term and around for businesses just in general. Uh, we have SCORE, we have the Center for Women in Enterprise, that is our Women's Business Center and our Veterans Business Outreach Center, and then we have the Small Business Development Center. All are staffed um, and have got increased staff capacity because of COVID to provide free business advising to small businesses. So strongly encourage anybody here that has a business that doesn't have a relationship with one of our partners to reach out to them. 
They've also done an amazing job of doing all kinds of online training um, to navigate all of these different COVID programs, but also just on a lot of business topics. Um, they're really a great resource um, and we really couldn't have gotten through the last 18 months without them. Just wanna share a quick story of a success story um, that we worked with. It's called Hammer Art Studio and Cultural Center in Pelham. Uh, and the owner there worked with one of our SCORE mentors on a variety of different things. Um, she has a, a cultural and arts center that does child, she started out doing child art classes, but she expanded into culinary classes and camps and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, she was able to work with our SCORE mentor that helped her with strategic planning, um, lease negotiation, um, all of those kinds of things where you want to have that independent kind of advice uh, from somebody outside of your organization that can kind of walk you through things and give you that bird's eye view of that. She was also able to pivot during COVID and offer to go art projects, um, which really expanded her market uh, and created another revenue stream for her. So this is, these are the types of assistance that you can get by working with one of our resource partners. And then just a few, I just, this is mostly, I just wanna share this so that you'll have them in the presentation. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time here, but the SBA does offer, um, you know, we do highlight different special initiatives. We have our Small Business Week Summit coming up on uh, September 13th through the 15th. We usually do a big celebration in May where we have local awards. We're doing a virtual event um, this, this year because of everything going on. But we also celebrate veterans with Veterans Small Business Week. We do a quarterly, um, boots to business session. We encourage shop small with small business Saturday, and we just do a variety of different outreach to help rural areas, youth entrepreneurship, uh, work very closely with towns to get information out to the small businesses and business associations as well. Also partner with the state on a couple specific programs um, and, and try to collaborate as much as we can on you know, just getting information out to small businesses and resources. And then just wanna leave you with our contact information. So this is everyone in our staff on how to get a hold of us. Uh, the best thing here to do is go to our website, which is sba.gov slash nh. And at the bottom right, you can join our um, email blast. And that's where we are trying to update people on all the programs in SBA that have been rolled out, any updates. Also, we have a section called what others are doing to help. So we try to keep an ear out for what other associations and other economic development groups in the state are doing to help businesses and highlight those in there as well. So definitely encourage everyone uh, to do that and also reach out to our office if we can be of any of assistance. And the best way is to use that email address there, which is New Hampshire spelled out underscore DO for district office at sba.gov. And we appreciate the opportunity for being with you today. Thanks for having us. Hey, thank, thank you, Rachel. On the examples, that, that helps a lot because the federal programs are sometimes hard to, uh, to get through. So I appreciate that. Sure. Uh, yep, next up, uh, Danielle Warden Ramos, uh, Workforce Development, Department of Labor. Hey, folks, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I had some issues this morning. Okay, one second. Okay, so I'm coming from the US Department of Labor, Employment and Training Administration. Um, we have two types of funding, which we call uh, the formula side, which is based on a formula that Congress um, creates at the beginning of every year. Um, those are our WIOA funds, which are called the Workforce in Innovation and Opportunity Act and Trade Adjustment Act funds. Um, and we fund those two state workforce agencies on an annual basis. So these funds are administered by the state to fund their local workforce development system. So New, New Hampshire gets an allocation from our department um, to fund their, their workforce development system, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so through this funding, they fund what we call American Job Centers, or many of you know them as one-stop centers, um, which serve as the hub for service provision of our adult, disability worker, and youth employment programs. Um, then we have the discretionary side, 
which is uh, considered our competitive grants. And those are, you know, we have many of those that are awarded in New Hampshire. Those are awarded on a competitive basis, which means that folks have to apply and then be awarded based on the merit of the application. Um, and we can provide a listing of those resources should anyone be interested um, to see which competitive grants exist in New Hampshire uh, right now. So for the formula funded grants, uh, New Hampshire has 12 American job centers uh, that are located throughout the state. They have many comprehensive centers, which means that they have access to a number of different partner programs. We have through WIOA some required partners. So you'll see uh, vocational rehab, adult basic education. Uh, some of the, the centers will have um, what we call TNF so in, in SNAP and other benefits uh, for folks who come into the center and need a little bit more than just our workforce development programming. Um, they also have affiliate centers, which do not offer all of the, pro the partner programs, um, but they are in helpful places such as public libraries, et cetera. So you can access the system, you know, through a little bit less of a aggressive center. Um, so where our we are funding goes to adult dislocated worker and youth programming, and that is for things like career counseling, rapid reemployment. So, you know, you might upload your resume. We, they have a, a job bank of active jobs that are, you know, active within the state. And then folks can take advantage of, you know, the, the employers can take advantage of looking at some of the resumes and saying, hey, you know what, this really works for my business. I would like to have an interview with this person. And then on the job seeker side, the job seeker can look at all of the available uh, opportunities that have already been vetted through the state. So we know they're real versus, you know, sometimes monster might have some that don't necessarily exist. Um, so folks can take advantage of looking at all of the different options um, that they have available to them within their community or even outside of their community. Um, we also do job readiness workshops, training opportunities, obviously employment and training administration. One of our biggest focus is now on training. Um, so, you know, folks will work with their counselor and determine kind of what is their next step? Do they need training or can they be rapidly employed? Um, and so the centers and, and their career counselors would help find, you know, training opportunities for folks to upskill or uh, to move into a different career path. Um, and obviously there's, there's different resources available um, through these centers. So uh, as I alluded to earlier, business customers have access to an array of services um, through the one stops, obviously we have the job bank, but then we also have um, job matching. There's some customized training and upskilling of incumbent workers. So when we say incumbent workers, those are people who are already working. Uh, this is really big for manufacturing companies. Oftentimes the technology is, is getting different and they need to train their workers. And that represents kind of a, you know, an economic hardship to train up that many workers. So we offer, um, customized training to help upskill the workers that are already in the, in the job um, so that they don't have to let people go or you know be burdened by uh, some of the financial pieces of training. And then obviously the workers have a new set of skills that um, makes them more competitive in the job market as well. Uh, they do recruitment help, job fairs. Um, many times they'll do vetting of folks before they send them out to interviews um, and then we have what's called the Workforce Opportunity Tax Credits, which are something that folks apply for, um, essentially for you know employers who might want to take a bit of a risk on maybe someone who comes from the returning citizen ex-offender community. Um, so this just gives them a tax credit to take the take the risk to hire this person um, and, and get a tax credit for it. Um, in terms of ways to find your local American Job Center in New Hampshire. Uh, we have a national website, which is called careeronestop.org. It gives you all of the different <clears throat> uh, AJCs within the state and all of the states actually within the United States. You can find you know, whatever the times that they're open, uh, the address, phone numbers, et cetera. And then I did wanna speak a little bit about registered apprenticeship. We actually do have an apprenticeship office within ETA. Um, so that is a, a little bit, um, not my bailiwick, but we do have folks who work on that if you would like some information about that. Um, 
Currently, there's 388 active programs registered in the state with 2,847 apprentices. Uh, New Hampshire is pretty big with advanced manufacturing, construction, IT, marine trades, defense, uh, and healthcare. Though we are always looking for opportunities to kind of break into new and different um, types of apprenticeship. So the opportunities to create apprenticeship programs are always open. Uh, the state entity is actually the entity that works on the creation of registered apprenticeship pro programs. So anyone interested in making, you know, if there's employers on the call who's interested in making an apprenticeship program, um, it would be the state agency that you would want to contact. Federal, the federal agency does not do any of the creation of the programs, though we can provide any resources that you need. And that's kind of a, a quick and dirty of what USDOL ETA does in New Hampshire. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, next up, Andrea and Seven Allen. She is a community program specialist with the U.S. Department of Agricultural Rural Development. Hello, everyone. I hope you're able to hear me okay. My um, internet is giving me a little, okay, excellent. My internet yep. seems to be giving me a little trouble, but um, so thank you very much for inviting us um, to the presentation. Many of you may be thinking arts and cultural um, projects, how does USDA fit into this? Um, some of you we may have worked with very much in the past, others of you may be new to our um, program, but let me give you a little bit of background. Um, it's true when you think USDA, usually you're thinking food programs, farming, natural resources, but uh, rural development has been a part of USDA for a long time. We don't do any agriculture. We work specifically in the rural areas of the country, typically in uh, areas 50,000 people or less, which for New Hampshire and Vermont, that's quite a bit of coverage. Um, our mission area is to increase economic opportunity and improve the quality of life for all rural Americans. We do that primarily through financing. We um, have programs that include loan guarantees where you have a commercial loan and we guarantee it. So you're more, your bank is more willing to look at something that they might otherwise consider risky. Uh, we do direct loans and we have grant programs. With USDA Rural Development, we have over 40 loan and grant programs. What we usually tell people is if you have a project that you think you might be eligible or looking at our funding might fit, give us a call. We'll help find the right program that fits what you're looking to do. Oftentimes we say it's not a question of when, if, it's a question of when, if we're able to get you some funding on your project. Uh, to give you a little overview of who's actually here on the ground in New Hampshire, our jurisdiction is a two-state jurisdiction. We cover New Hampshire and Vermont. We have offices in Concord and Conway. I'm actually based out of Brattleboro, but I cover, I live in Keene. So um, New Hampshire is close to my heart. And um, the main state office is out of Montpelier. Um, with our 40 grant loan and grant programs, we concentrate in four different areas, um, business programs, community programs, housing programs, and utility programs. You may know us in housing previously as the Farmers Home Administration. We've been around for a very long time. I'm gonna focus on two programs within the business programs and the community programs today. But um, keep in mind that we have many different initiatives. We have many different aspects where we might be able to help you. The primary program I'm gonna talk about today is one that I work in most of my time. It's called the Community Facilities Program. Um, here we have guaranteed loans, direct loans and grants available to nonprofits and municipalities. Um, this program focuses on communities that are less than 20,000 people. And it attempts to help with essential community facilities. Now, what exactly are essential community facilities? We look at that with a very broad brush. We look at everything from municipalities in terms of town halls, police stations, fire trucks, um, many nonprofits in daycare, um, in senior care, in schools, um, community centers. 
and for what you're interested in today, arts and cultural facilities. We put a lot of um, money into theaters and other types of cultural facilities. I'll give you some examples of who we work with in the past. Um, a lot of these are um, Vermont, but you probably have heard of them. Uh, the Latches Theater in Brattleboro, uh, Catamount Arts up in Littleton area, New Hampshire, Park Theater over in Jaffrey, uh, the New England Center for Circus Arts. That's one of my favorite ones in, Brattle, uh, in Brattleboro. Um, Yellow Barn, uh, the music organization, we helped them purchase practice pods where people could sit in a, their own little mobile home, environmentally sustainable and have practice areas. Uh, we've put money into strolling of the heifers, Paramount Theater in um, Rutland, and uh, many different areas. The great thing about this program is it's available for nonprofits and municipalities to um, do capital purchases or capital improvements. We don't do any operating funds under this, but you can buy equipment, furniture, and fixtures. You can use it to improve your facility. Uh, we've helped with elevators, we've helped with um, sound systems and lighting systems. That has been a big one that we've looked at. We've helped with um, replacing roofs and we've also helped with expanding into solar. Um, Catamount, that was one of the projects we did where they purchased solar panels on a solar farm and we were able to help them fund that. The grants in this program are matching. It depends on the median household income of your community that you're serving. And it can be used in combination with our direct loan program, which right now is at 2.25% and can be extended up to 30 years, depending on the project. And it's a fixed rate. Um, or we also partner with a lot of other agencies, either state or federal agencies and other organizations to do these projects. We are, we're happy to work together with other partners on these projects. Um, let me hit the next one that I'm going to focus on today. Uh, in the, our business and cooperative programs, we have a rural business development grant. This is available for nonprofits and municipalities, again, um, for communities of 50,000 and under. So that um, widens the scope that we can fund there. This program is primarily to assist small businesses retain or grow their um, positions to keep jobs. And this, it may seem a little odd from the arts and grants or, or arts and cultural area, but we have done it um, in New Hampshire. Primarily, I can think of with Hannah Grimes Development out of Keene. Uh, we provided funding to them to do um, workshops for their small businesses, their art, artists, artisans, um, to develop their markets, to learn how to sell um, to a wider audience and to increase their producti productivity and um, their marketing um, um, tools. Uh, this program will provide technical assistance. So we'll pay for a nonprofit to give uh, workshops or a program of training to small businesses, small artisan businesses. Um, it will also provide equipment um, to nonprofits and municipalities. So, um, this is another aspect of where you might be able to get some funding. Sometimes we've had organizations that have been very entrepreneurial and have applied for both this grant program for one part of a project and the community facilities program for the other part of the project. So we're able to help them in multiple ways. We have, as I said, many, many different programs. The best way for us to help you is to give us a call and let us know what your project is, what you're trying to do, and we will see what works best for your um, program. Um, my suggestion is the first contact, we have a new system. Once you have a project idea, um, first contact would be John Michael Muse, our area director. He covers the Southern half of um, New Hampshire and Vermont, um, but he will put you in touch with the right person. And his contact information is on there. I also suggest contacting our website uh, that not only has general information about our programs, but if you dive into it, it actually has the application forms and process and deadlines. So you can find all of that there. If you have any questions, please feel free to give us a call. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was really interesting. 
And over the last um, eight years I've been uh, working with the USDA, the, the definition of rural development is much, much greater than people would think. So thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Katie Lamoureux is the community planner for the US Department of Transportation at the Volpe Center. Good morning. Um, my name is Katie Lamro. I'm with the U.S. Department of Transportation Volpe Center, um, and I'm providing this presentation on behalf of FEMA. Uh, I know I'm standing between the open discussion and, and we're a couple minutes behind, so I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, but I want to say up front that this role um, can also help serve as a connector with other um, federal government agencies at the in the transportation department. So if there are questions after or anything else that you know we're trying to connect to the right person, um, we can serve in that function as well. Um, so first, uh, the overall thinking about as as Jim mentioned that having an outcomes based um, approach here, kind of just thinking about. Uh, the how and how transportation uh, fits into the bigger placemaking picture. So this diagram is from the Project for Public Spaces. And as you can see here, uh, transportation kind of fills this a quarter of the, of the placemaking effort. So thinking about how to implement those linkages and access for different modes of transportation, bicycle, pedestrian, transit. So um, have focused on the programs and partners um, at all levels that can help with that. So um, here, first thinking about transportation partners. So um, when trying to implement projects, thinking about partners at the community level, um, ones that either have ownership or maintenance responsibilities, or uh, help to do the transportation planning and programming with the uh, regional planning commissions, metropolitan planning organizations, and state department of transportation. So all those different community departments that, that you could partner with are on the left. On the right, so New Hampshire has nine regional planning commissions that, that serve in a, a transportation planning and programming role. There are also four metropolitan planning organizations, and those are planning organizations that plan for populations of 50,000 or more. So those include the Southern New Hampshire region, um, the Rockingham region, uh, Stratford, and Nashua region, so down in the in the southern um, area of New Hampshire, of course. Uh, so, and then at the state level, of course, New Hampshire DOT. Each of these agencies have different roles that they play in planning and programming. The New Hampshire DOT serves as the lead, um, and in a lot of ways, New Hampshire across the country is seen as kind of a noteworthy practice for coordination for transportation planning and programming. So, there's a really good um, coordinated approach in New Hampshire. Um, there's, and actually we'll get to the 10 year plan in a second, but the Federal Highway Administration, New Hampshire division. So within the Federal Highway Administration, there's a division office for each state and they serve as a field office for um, providing technical support and guidance to the state DOT. So that's a great resource. And the first kind of point of contact if you want to reach out to Federal Highway and then FTA um, has regional offices. And so, and they, not only support the DOT and the metropolitan planning organizations, but also the, the public transit operators. Um, and then uh, just some overall considerations, as, as many of you probably already know, the FAST Act reauthorization is set to expire in September. And so um, Congress is working on a reauthorization of the FAST Act now, currently. Um, so all of the programs that, that are currently in, in place are subject to change with that reauthorization. Um, there could be new programs coming out of that. You know, we can track some of the, the things that are in the House and the Senate, but nothing has been um, confirmed yet. So that's just kind of something to keep in mind. And if there is a particular transportation project that you're thinking about um, in New Hampshire with regard to placemaking, just kind of keeping a finger on the pulse as those things change and, and um, the reauthorization happens. And then the other thing I just wanted to note is that, as I mentioned, New Hampshire is a noteworthy practice when it comes to coordinating transportation planning and programming. And they have uh, New Hampshire has a 10 year plan where a lot of states don't um, don't have that. So it's, it's unique to New Hampshire. Um, the that for that 10 year plan happens every two years. It's a state requirement. So that is just kicking off right now, the two year update. So if you do have transportation projects, um, I think that the first kind of point of contact would be a regional planning commission, MPO, or, or of course the state DOT, but to try to coordinate 
those projects with that um, planning effort. And then I know we're really short on time. I do have a, a whole bunch of different programs. A lot of that, every one of these has the link, a deadline, contact information. I know these slides will be provided after. So I think I might, if we want to leave time for discussion, I'll leave it up to you, Jim. But I could just kind of skip this portion and, and provide that in the slides after if that would be more useful. Yeah, Katie, if, if that would be great. If yeah. that's okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Great. Thank you. That was interesting. Um, next up is uh, Rick Kendall. He is the superintendent, National Park Service, the Stewardship Institute. Rick. Thank you, Jim. Uh, hopefully y'all can hear me. I will endeavor to be brief as well. We can, we can hear you. Great. Uh, as we come down to the end of the day, thank you for the invite to speak. Uh, I think you all may know the National Park Service for our role in managing 120 or so national park units in every state and uh, territory in the U.S., including uh, New Hampshire's own St. Gaudens National Historical Park in Cornish, as well as the Appalachian Trail that winds through the state. Uh, but in addition to managing the national parks, the uh, NPS also manages a variety of other programs uh, to support outdoor recreation as well as the arts, and many of these are not grant programs and don't necessarily provide uh, organizations with the opportunity to apply for money, but they do uh, provide access to a variety of technical experts in fields that can help advance projects in arts, conservation, and other fields. And I uh, wanted to share a couple of these programs with you all today. Uh, the first of which is the uh, Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance Program, which uh, works with hundreds of partners around the U.S. to turn uh, conservation and outdoor recreation visions into reality. Um, our uh, RTCA specialists, of which uh, we have them based in both uh, New Hampshire and Vermont, uh, really help with uh, aligning project planning, design, technical expertise, and facilitating initial meetings and scoping. Um, and depending upon the scale of the project can uh, invest up to four years of work in uh, developing and implementing a project with uh, uh, an applicant or a partner. Uh, our teams help with things like community engagement, visioning and planning, uh, developing inclusive access, uh, leveraging resources from others with shared goals and the list goes on and on. Uh, our RTCA projects typically have a conservation or outdoor recreation focus, but increasingly, uh, have an arts and culture focus as well. Uh, the picture on the screen right now is at uh, Boston Harbor Islands with uh, an outdoor art installation that also helps to uh, uh, interpret the landscape. Um, and here is another one from uh, Ellis Island uh, in New York Harbor where uh, an artist made uh, uh, large blown up photographs of, uh, of immigrants and uh, placed them around the, uh, the hospital building. Uh, at uh, Ellis Island, which is uh, largely a ruin at this point. Um, and throughout the Northeast, our, our staff have been engaged in dozens of these projects that have incorporated arts creation or arts display uh, as a major goal or as an indicator of success. Uh, our communities, nonprofits, government institutions, tribes, uh, and others may apply for RTCA assistance, and that's through an call for proposals that occurs annually in the spring. And you can find more information on that at uh, the website that is on the screen here, uh, nps.gov slash RTCA. Uh, another program that the National Park Service uh, 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 is involved with that may be of interest is the Historic Preservation Tax Credit Program, which is a uh, actually a partnership between the National Park Service, the Internal Revenue Service, and uh, the State Historic Preservation Offices, of which each state has one, including New Hampshire. Um, knowing that the inventory of historic buildings in New England is high, and in order to incentivize preservation of historic buildings rather than tearing them down uh, in favor of new construction, uh, the uh, tax credit program offers a 20% income tax credit for the rehabilitation of uh, income producing buildings, which are certified as historic structures and the rehabilitation meets DOI standards. And over the last five years, uh, New Hampshire, I believe, has seen uh, 10 of these projects valued at $81 million uh, in tax credit eligible renovations work through this program. Uh, it can be used for a variety of spaces, including art studios, galleries, uh, and other arts purposes. 
Um, and then finally, uh, just a, a little bit about uh, St. Gaudens National Historical Park and uh, partnership opportunities there. Uh, we are now in year four of our quest to build uh, the first national park for the arts at our uh, Blow Me Down Farm property. Blow Me Down Farm consists of 42 acres, uh, nine historic structures, uh, really incomparable views uh, across uh, the Connecticut River into Vermont to Mount Escutney. Uh, in 2020, we uh, finalized a partnership agreement with an Upper Valley uh, performing arts company called Opera North. Uh, for the farm to become their home of their uh, summer fest. They're also renovating the big house and we're working together uh, to make the farm a destination for performing and vis visual arts. Um, the space, like I said, is gorgeous, it's flexible. And last year in the midst of the pandemic, uh, Opera North's outdoor performances in August were one of the only places on the Eastern seaboard where performing arts were, uh, were happening outdoors on the days of the performance. <laughs> Uh, we have other buildings and other partnership opportunities uh, available for organizations that might be interested in becoming a part of this National Park for the Arts concept. And so please feel free to uh, shoot me an email if you'd like to learn more. Uh, my email is down here on the bottom of the page. Um, and uh, you can also reach me through uh, the contact information that uh, I'm sure Jenny will be sending around. And at that, I will yield the floor. And thank you, everyone. Thanks, Rick. That was, that was interesting. Um, I'm going to pass over now to Jenny, and she's going to run the uh, Q&A. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Wow, this is incredibly informative. And um, I look forward to getting lots of information out to our participants today. Um, we've had a couple of, of um, questions in the chat that appear to have been answered. Um, but um, I open up the floor um, for any questions that folks might have in the next few minutes. Um, you may want to use the raise hand function, which is under the reactions button um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have a question, just feel free to raise your hand and um, we will. I've got two screens worth of people, so I'm going to be bopping back and forth between them um, looking for raised hands. And I don't see any. <laughs> I know it's a lot of information to absorb in this last hour, um, but um, a lot of really, ah, Russ. Hi, Jenny. Um, could the representative from the USDA just once again clarify the distinction between the types of grants for communities of under 20,000 people versus the types of grants for communities under 50,000 people? Sure. Uh, the community facility grant is the one for under 20,000 people. Uh, those are typically grants, they're matching grants up to $50,000. Um, they're for nonprofits and municipalities. The other program, the Rural Business Development Grant, is for, through the business programs, it's up to 50,000 population. Those grants can be anywhere from 10,000 to 75,000. Uh, they're you get extra points for matching um, and they run on a little bit different scoring system than the other community facilities. Did that answer your question? Um, sort of, I understand the one under 20,000 includes facilities. Are there facility capabilities for grants over uh, under 50,000 or is it a different type of programming grant you're applying for? It, it's, it's a different type of program. The community facilities are capital purchases and improvements. So um, buildings, furniture, fixture, equipment, um, parking lot renovations for ADA, that sort of thing. Um, the business development grant would be primarily for technical assistance, um, purchasing computers for um, um, a business program, signage downtown um, to be able to get your tourists to the right places to increase business for small businesses. Does that help? Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks, Russ. Um, I see April's hand is up. Hi. <clears throat> yeah. So um, I'm a representative of a regional arts council, Arts Alive, and um, we have a project that is a, you know, like an arts corridor development planning going on, and 
there's so much overlap with so many of these programs that were described here with what you know with what we're doing because of the just the diverse nature of it everything from you know maybe getting a parking structure so that we can open up space to um you know actual arts programs and getting artists in that space so i'm just wondering given that there are so many programs you described and i found i heard a lot of overlap with our needs what's our best approach that's a really good question april like is there um, a, is there a one person we <laughs> that you know can help us sort through this because or or not i think this is andy i think you're going to have to talk to all of us um <laughs> and we can help you figure out which aspects of your project are the most relevant for our grant programs our our town folks are going to be your best bet at our agency and there's a special our town mailbox ot at arts arts .gov, and and our, our town folks work with the USDA rural development folks all the time at headquarters level. So we're very familiar with their programs and we have a good collaborative working relationship so we can all get involved together. Oftentimes, April, if you have a good write-up of what you wanna do, you touch base with many of the different um, organizations that may be helpful. I know that John oftentimes will convene sort of like a funders meeting to all meet with you at the same time so you can hash out what might work best for different agencies. Thank is, you. Is this John Muse? Yes. Okay. yes. Thank you, Andy and Andrea, I appreciate that. So Lucinda has a question in the chat. And I think Lucinda is referring to the Save Our Granite Stages language that was in the most recently enacted state budget. Um, that grant program is currently unfunded um, and we don't know if it will be funded, Lucinda, but even if you were to receive a grant through that program, it would not prohibit you from applying for a direct NEA grant. Any other questions today? Any other questions? A little over time. Um, and so I want to thank our presenters for your time today and your incredible information that you've provided. We'll be getting um, the video link and um, the slide decks and other information out to you as soon as we can. Uh, many thanks to Jim for moderating um, our, our webinar today. And um, feel free to reach out to us. Um, save the chat before you go. Um, Lisa Burke McCoy of our staff uh, posted a couple of links and some information that could be very helpful. And um, thank you all. Any closing words from anyone before we say goodbye? Okay, thank you everyone. Take care, enjoy your day. Bye-bye. Thank you.